Today, my hope and my prayer is that we can experience the power of the blood that we have available to us. Even right now, as we sit here today, I promise you the blood is still running fresh. Let's go to Genesis 3.21. Let's stand and read this scripture and pray, and then I'll just get into what God has laid on my heart this morning. It says, Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. I never have you turn and look to anybody, and I'm not going to have you this morning, but I'm going to ask you if you would just simply lift your hands and lift your eyes and look at the Lord and say, Thank you for covering me. Thank you for covering me, Lord. God, I thank you for the covering of the blood. Oh, shut up, I. God, I pray this morning that as we lift our hands, as we lift our eyes to you in thanksgiving for covering us, God, that we could experience and feel the power of the blood in this house this morning, that we could experience and encounter the power of the Holy Ghost in this house this morning, God, that we could walk out of here knowing that no matter what devil in hell has come against us or no matter what we have done, God, God, that we are covered by you. God, we thank you this morning. Thank you for covering us. In Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. You see, I feel like most days that we as Christians, I do believe that we try to walk through life in a manner that represents Christ. Well, I don't think we intentionally try to go out and sin. We don't intentionally try to give a bad name to the church or to Jesus or anything like that. I think most, for the most part, we wake up and we make a conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have mistakes. We're going to make small missteps along the way. We're going to stumble from time to time. We're going to speak an errant word that maybe we would like to take back. But along the way, I believe generally speaking, we mostly have good days. We try to fulfill what Jesus has called for us. I'm not trying to beat anybody up this morning. I want you to walk out of here encouraged. I want you to walk out of here feeling like David with his little sling ready to take on Goliath because you know that the Lord, your God, is on your side and that it doesn't matter what is standing in front of you, that you can walk out and you can overtake the obstacles. I do believe we look for opportunities to tell of Jesus Christ or simply to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to feed those that are hungry, to give water to those that thirst, to, to speak life to those that may not have hope. We try to do good. Here's a little bit of a joke, but it's also, I believe, partly true. Most of us, I believe, authentically look for time to read the Word and to pray. I'm kind of hard on people that don't read. And I believe for the most part, we look for time to read instead of looking for excuses not to. I hope you do anyway. If I'm wrong, then don't let me find out. Just go back and start making that effort. You need to read. You need to read. But each day we make the effort to serve better than we did the day before. We continually strive to grow in Christ and through Christ and in life as a Christian. In other words, we put forth effort each day simply to be closer to Christ and to be more pleasing to the Father. You know, the reality is, and we see this even in our day-to-day -day relationships, that if you truly love your spouse, each day you try to do more to grow closer to them. I can only speak to my relationship, me and Joni. There was a time when I was a heathen that I simply didn't put the attention into my relationship that I needed to put into it, that I didn't follow through and do the things that I needed to do. But as you stay together and as you grow in love and as you grow throughout the years, you try more and more day after day. It should be the same thing. We are the bride of Christ. He is a good, good father to us. And if we sincerely love him, we will stumble less tomorrow than we do today. Next week, we will misstep less than we do this week. In other words, as our relationship grows with him, we are going to continually improve in what we do. And I believe that we mostly succeed. 
We reflect the light that is Jesus Christ to the world around us. And, and we make that sincere effort to wear well that badge that doesn't say Steve or Stanley or Aaron, but that says Son of God or Jody, Daughter of God, Christian. We try to wear that label well, but there are exceptions. There's always exceptions in behavior that happen to us all from time to time. If you live long enough, if you try long enough, if you follow Christ long enough, one day you will be an exception to all that I just said. Even though most days we do well to reflect the light and the love of Christ, there are days or at the very least moments in our life when we would be hard-pressed to know who or what we follow. People will look at us and in, in that dark moment that we have in our moment of anger or moment of, of whatever is going on, they would look and they would say, I thought they went to church. There's a story, and I wish I would have thought to, to have got it, but there's a story about a police officer being behind a woman stuck in traffic, and you know she has all the right bumper stickers on her car. I love Jesus, and she's got the little fish, and I attend this church, and, and she's got the little plaque around her plate that tells all about her life and the the person behind the wheel though is beeping their horn and hanging their head out the window and making unbecoming hand gestures and cussing at people in the traffic with the police officer behind her so he flips on his lights and pulls her over and starts questioning her and she's wondering what's going on he said well, man by all the stuff that i've seen on the back and your behavior i thought this car must be stolen <laughs> yeah that we do, and, and that's a funny to prove a point, but we do the same thing. We'll wear our Mill Creek Church of God t-shirt out, or we'll have our little I, I Love Jesus bumper sticker, our little fish in our back window, but then someone will see us doing something, and they will look at us, and they'll say, I thought they went to church. If they're going to act like that, I don't need to follow them. I need to go somewhere else. We all have those little moments where we reflect darkness or our attitude and our behavior would lead people to a conclusion that we are, in fact, not saved. It happens. We live these micro moments in time, and, and if they take them out of context, they don't know our character. They don't know that we try to walk in the spirit-filled life that we are called to. They just look and they see that momentary slip where we're fulfilling the will of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. We lose our temper. We don't hold our tongue. We'll gossip. I've got a good message coming up on that before long. Boy, we will hammer. We will hammer homosexuality, fornication, abortion, and gossip is killing the church. Amen. Let me not get off on that today. We exhibit a lack of patience. That's me. Let me raise my hand. Let me raise my hand. Or we show that we really don't have the faith in God that he can handle the situation that is in front of us. We will go and we will tell our very best friend that old, tired, worn out comment, you just need to turn it over to Jesus. And then we will walk away from that friend and we will go to our own situation and not turn it over at all. We go and we tell them and we say it with a smile, well, honey, you just need to give it to Jesus and everything's going to be okay. We lie to them. We lie to them outright that if you just turn it over, that everything's going to work out the way you want it to work out. And that couldn't be further from the truth. If you truly turn it over to God, it will work out the way He needs it to work out for your good. But then we get done telling them that and we walk over and we pick up our own issues and our own troubles and we carry them around like a sack of weight around our shoulders. That's just as bad. It's just as bad as if you were in traffic with all the right stickers, cussing and swarping. We don't have faith that God can handle it. So many things can easily portray the wrong idea about who we serve. And then here's the bad thing. In our flesh, when we have these little moments in time when we seem to falter and we seem to fail and we seem to walk away from what we know God is doing in our life, we get dejected. Instead of running back to the cross, we start getting dejected. We start listening to the whispering of the devil that is in our ear telling us, look, you have already failed, you have already misstepped, you have already stumbled on something you should have stood on top of. 
We get into a place where we start questioning our relationship with Jesus Christ. We'll start wondering about our salvation. And if we're not careful, we get into a place where we think we are too far gone. Well, I'm not talking to the sinners about that. I'm talking to you folks that are sitting in here that claims to wear the badge of Christian. I'm telling you, you are going to stumble at some point. You are going to misspeak at some point. There is going to be something that you have to repent over at some point. But do it and move on with your life. Don't listen to the voice of the devil that is in your ear. I'm telling you, God loves you more than that. You didn't throw away your child when they messed up. God is not throwing away away his children when you have a little stumble don't you start questioning your relationship if the Holy Spirit's still pulling on you just go back to the Father he's waiting on you but I promise when we don't walk in the favor of God when we don't walk in the authority of God as a child but we walk around with our heads down as a servant. I talked about this Wednesday night. When we walk around as a servant with no authority, the devil will wear you out daily. I, I'm not talking about he's going to wear you out when it's time to go to church on Sunday. I'm talking about if some of you don't start throwing your head back and start throwing your shoulders back and stiffening your spine a little bit, you're going to start giving in to what the devil's whispering in your ear. Some of you need to lift your head up. You need to lift your hands up. You need to stiffen your spine. And you need to start walking in the authority that God has given you. He has not called you to be a servant. He has not called you to be a slave. But God Almighty sent His only begotten Son so that you could be an heir and a joint heir with His Son. In other words, so that you can be adopted into the kingdom. You are not on the outside looking in, but you have the authority of God that you carry around with you that you are on the inside looking out. Now here's another little bonus nugget. You can't resist that which you are in bed with. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But when you're in the bed with the devil, you can't resist it. And you're not submitted to God either. And furthermore, if you're not submitted to God, you can't resist the devil. You can't do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. You cannot quit the drugs on your own. You cannot quit the addictions on your own. You cannot quit the gossiping on your own. You can't quit the, the, the fornicating lifestyle on your own. Look, I could go into the, the science and the addictions behind all of that, and, and I'm going to tell you some of the addictions, uh, sexual addictions are just as difficult in your brain to break as some of the drug addictions are. Addiction is addiction. It knows no bounds. It knows no bounds. But you cannot break it on your own. If you sit and you say, I'm going to fix it, before I come to church, you will never ever walk to the altar because it will not get broken. Every time you think you're getting one step ahead, you will fall two steps back. Every time you break one addiction, two more is going to come in to take its place. You have to get to the altar and submit to God to resist the devil. And when you do, He will flee from you. But even when submitted to God, we are simply moving towards perfection. We're not perfect yet. We're only moving towards perfection. We strive, but life is difficult, and we will slip from time to time. We have to make amends, apologize, repent, and move forward. But even in the best of conditions, you can slip. But I have come with good news for you this morning. God has you covered. Yes. Now my intent wasn't to keep you here too long this morning, but I've got a few things to get through because I need to give you some examples. Because there is life, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. You see, that's where I had this inserted into my notes for this morning. And I have given it to you up on the altar to make atonement for your souls. Your soul cannot be atoned. You cannot spend an eternity in heaven unless it's covered by the blood. Amen. It's an impossibility. 
for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. We look at Adam and Eve and we go to that verse in Genesis 3.21 and, and I think we probably know the story of Adam and Eve relatively well. God made them with His own hands. I, I couldn't imagine being the very first that God created. Did He come down with His own hands and crafted out of clay and then come down with His own mouth and blew wind in, into their body, the, blew the Spirit into their body and brought them to life. We talk about claymation and all of these other things, but God done it for real and created mankind. Brought them to life. And they walked with God. Now, I, I'm not just talking they went by on Sundays and took a stroll with Him through the park. It, God was their life. And their life was God's. They walked with Him throughout the Garden of Eden. And they were empowered. They were empowered. God gave them this place to keep with authority. And day after day, they communed with Him in a perfect world and in a perfect state. Today, I don't know why we look at our lives and, and we think that someone shouldn't fail. I, I don't understand it. People will look at me because I'm a pastor, because I'm an ordained bishop, and they'll say, well, he shouldn't do that or he shouldn't do this. Folks, I'm human. I'm trying. I'm striving towards perfection, but I'm not there yet. They'll look at Brother Stanley as he's up here leading praise and worship. They'll say, well, he shouldn't do that. Well, he's just the same as me. He's flesh. He's striving towards perfection, but he's not there yet. Sister Browning, I'm going to use you as an example. We'll look at Sister Browning, and we'll say she's been in the church all these years, and she's heard the commentary through all of these times, and, and she sat under all of these great preachers that Mill Creek's had in the past, and, and she's been communing with God for so many years. Surely she can't make a mistake. Well, I'm here to tell you, surely Sister Browning can still make a mistake just the same as the rest of us because she's still alive on this earth. She's still flesh. I'm not saying that to be a bad thing, Sister Browning. It's just, it's just facts. We're flesh. We're going to fail at some point. But I cannot understand how when God makes you with His own hands, walks with you day after day in a state of perfection, that everything is under your authority and under your power, that you still fail. That God makes you in perfection and He gives you one simple commandment. Don't eat that tree. Eat everything else in the world. Go anywhere else you want. Just don't touch that one thing. What do they do? They make a beeline for it. Now we can lay the fault at the feet of the woman or the feet of the man. I, I tend to do both, but I'll, I'll be honest, I lean more towards it's Adam's fault. We can say Eve took the bite, which is true, but when you read the text, Adam was standing by watching and never said a word. They failed. They succumbed to temptation even though they were the very ones made directly by the hand of God. But can I tell you something? Even if you think you're in that state where you shouldn't be able to fail and then you mess up, don't you listen to the devil whispering to you. Because God looked down and He seen His creation that He loved and He set the precedence for what had to happen. When they failed, God come down and it says He made them a coat of skins. Now I'm thoroughly convinced, I can't prove it from the text, but you will never be able to persuade me otherwise. I believe God come down and took a choice lamb to sacrifice for them to give them coats of skin. Why? Because when Abraham took Isaac upon the mountain, it was a ram that had his horn caught in a thicket that was able to make a covering for Isaac. When John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's a lamb's blood that has to take away the sin and I believe when God looked down and he seen Adam and Eve and he seen that they had sinned, he come down and he took a choice lamb and he set the precedence and he spilled the blood that covered them up and he covered up their shame he covered up their sin, he covered up all their wrongdoing of the past so that the next time that he looked down, he didn't see their desertion, he didn't see their 
failure. He didn't see their disobedience. But when God looked down at them after that, all he seen was the blood. We could go and we could talk about David, how he was anointed, how he was chosen by God to be a king. But time after time, David seemed to not be able to get it right. He was disobedient when he took a census. He lusted after Bathsheba up on the, the rooftop. We could go on and on with his failures, but there was an important part that made David a man after God's own heart. When he failed, he repented. When he had made a sin, he went and made a sin offering. So here's the thing. When God looked down at David, he didn't see the adultery. He didn't see the murder of Bathsheba's husband. He didn't see the disobedience and taking a sentence, the census. But when God looked down at David, all he seen was the blood that had been applied to the sins. I look at Peter in the Bible, and Peter was filled with fear at one point. We see Peter, the head that is back and forth, and he can't seem to quite get on track with Jesus. And, and Jesus tells him before the cock crows tonight, you're going to deny me three times. Peter, a man of God that was walking with him, that seen him feed the thousands, that seen him transfigured up on top of the mountain that seen him heal the blind man that heard him proclaimed as Jesus son of David that seen him proclaimed as Jesus the Lamb of God got more fear in him from what man could do than what Jesus could do and when they looked at him and said are you not one of his he said no and he denied Jesus and then he done it again and then he done it again but Jesus still went to the cross for him and when Jesus was hanging on the cross he took those sins of Peter upon him and all of a sudden when God looked down at Peter he didn't see the failures he didn't see the anger he didn't see the denial but what he seen was the blood of the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world we could look at Paul who stood by breathing threats and killing Stephen and not satisfied with it and left from there to go to Damascus to find more people to kill when he was on the road to Damascus, he encountered a risen Savior by the name of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, because he turned his anger and his sin and his murder and his trying destruction of the church over to an almighty God, it got covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. All of a sudden, all of that sinful past, all of a sudden, all of the murder, all of the threats, all of the destruction of the church was no longer seen. But when God Almighty looked down at Paul, he didn't see the sinful past, but all he seen was the blood of Jesus Christ. God has you covered. He has you covered. You might have stumbled after walking with Him for 50 years. Friend, it don't matter. God has you covered. You might be like David. You might be anointed and called, but you can't quite seem to get it together. I'm telling you, just like Adam and Eve, if you will get under the blood, God still has you covered. You might be like Peter. You might be fearful to step out and do all that God has called you to do. But I'm telling you, if you will just get it to the altar, when God looks down, all He's going to see is the blood. He has you covered. You might have a sinful past like Paul. You might have tried to speak against the church, destroy the church. You might have even killed someone. I don't know, but what I know is if you bring it all to the altar and put it under the blood, when God looks down, He's not going to see your sin, but all He's going to see is the blood of Jesus Christ. God has you covered. I don't know what you've got going on this morning. I have no idea where you're at in your life this morning. But what I do know for a fact is that time after time, we see throughout the Bible that God has you covered. I can't cover you like God can. Your mommy and daddy can't cover you like God can. The, the justice system can't cover you like God can. Nobody on this earth can do you quite like Jesus. That's the power of the blood. 
When, when you start singing power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, that's the power in the blood. It can take your fear and turn it away. It can take your sin and cover it up. It can take all your timidness and make it into a passion for Jesus Christ. Whatever's going on in your life, the power of the blood is to reconcile you to God and to make you someone new. First and foremost this morning, if you are not under the blood, friend, please. I don't know what else to do but beg, come and get under the blood. I shared multiple times over the years of my ministry, but there was a point in, in my life I was just in a dark place. I was questioning whether God had abandoned me. I was questioning whether I'd done too much or gone too far, or spent too long not answering the call. You name it, it depended on what the day was as to what I was questioning. That's how the devil will work on you. And I can remember so crystal clear the position of the desk in our room where our bed was at, where I was laying in the bed. I was kind of like Paul, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. In other words, I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. But I seen just as clear, and I can still see it now, this old rough piece of log that had that dark crimson blood still flowing freely and heavily at the base. I know it's still fresh today. And I know that no matter what your past holds, if you will come, that blood will still cover it today. And I beg of you, I beg of you, if you have not made that trip, please, please make it. To everyone else, I would simply to tell you to reach up as close to you can to heaven with your voice, with your eyes, with your arms, with your praise, and just simply thank God this morning that he has you covered. Whatever you've got, bring it to the altar and lift it to God. Lift it to God. Throw your head up. Stiffen your backbone. Lift it up to God. And start giving Him the praise that no matter what it is, it is not beyond the reach of God. And I promise you, I promise you that the blood can cover anything. God has you covered.